What went wrong aboard a top secret jet to send it plowing into a quiet neighborhood? An Australian jockey is thrown, then caught by his stirrup. He struggles to free himself as his horse gallops towards the next jump. A subway train in Canada careers out of control. We find out why these crowded trains collide. Steeplechasing is the most dangerous equestrian sport of all. With its roots in fox hunting, a steeplechase course can feature 30 to 50 jumps. Log fences, stone walls, hedges, even creeks. Every race course is different. The only constant is the risk of injury. In Australia, the premier steeplechase is the Adelaide Cup. 70,000 fans are on hand to see 26 jockeys vie for $100,000 in prize money. Experienced jockey Simon Mills and his mounts of Sagamore are considered one of the favourites with odds of 8 to 1. The moment you and the horse are brought together on race day, there's got to be a, a team sort of effort put in. They're off. And the track is fast and the race goes smoothly was uh, Sagamore as they clear the first and over they go. As they near the finish, Simon and Sir Sagamore are in second place. But on the third to last jump, Mills is thrown. On the approach to the fence, everything was right up until about three or four strides away. And then that's when it all started. I, he shortened the stride and that's when I realised his timing was out. Everything was out. On the landing side of the fence, I was, I was all over his neck in the wrong position and bailing out. Mills is thrown forward over Sir Sagamore's neck and hits the ground in the middle of the pack. In an instant, he realises his foot is caught in the stirrup. I didn't, didn't even have time to panic. It's now almost impossible for Mills to get out of the stirrup and free himself from danger. His trainer is Hunter Nenman. He got popped loose in the air over the jump. His foot probably lifted up out of the stirrup a little bit and it just slipped right through his foot. Once it goes through the stirrup, it's really hard to get it out. The moment I noticed my foot was caught, naturally I tried to uh, pull it free, but uh, at that speed I was just a bit like a bag of potatoes. But the real trouble is just ahead. Another jump, four feet high, made of solid logs. If Sir Sagamore jumps and slams Mills into the fence, it will most likely kill him. Wondering whether you're going to be alive in another few seconds is just terrifying. Sir Sagamore does take the jump, but flies so high he catapults Simon completely over the top of the fence. It was just lucky the horse uh, took off a lot earlier than he normally would have and uh, catapulted me over it, you know, clear of the jump. When I landed the other side and thought, you know, I haven't hit this fence, I'm still all right. But then I still had the problem of when's this thing going to end? The jockeys behind Mills witness the accident, but they're sure that his situation is hopeless, including his friend and fellow jockey, David Londrigan. The way his body was getting flung around, it was just like a rag doll. And uh, I honestly thought that he was dead. Mills is still being dragged, and there are two more fences ahead. Londrigan gives up all thought of finishing the race and tries to save his friend instead. When we went over the fence, I thought he was dead. And that's why I sort of thought, well, I can't let the body get dragged up the straight. Londrigan fights to get Sir Sagamore under control by jamming him towards the rail. The horse slows. Again, Mills is flung into the air. But finally, his foot comes out of the stirrup and he rolls to a stop. I move my head from side to side and give my toes a wiggle and I thought, well, I'm, I'm still intact. It wasn't until I went to get my helmet off, I realised my um, arm was back up behind my head. Mills realises his left arm is broken, but he has no complaints. He knows he's fortunate to be alive. If I'd hit the fence full on, they'd be putting me in a bag. If I just hit it, maybe 
I would have got away with just, you know, no use in my arms and my legs. But to completely miss the fence was freakish. It was truly amazing. In steeplechasing, 1,500-pound horses and 100-pound jockeys is a dangerous mix. The control the jockey has over his horse is crucial. You're working with an animal that is upwards of five foot eight, you know, 1,500 pounds. They have a very small brain. Hunter Nenman trains both horses and riders. You're asking horses to jump and, and put all four, take all four feet off the ground and land and on the other side of the jump and hope that all four feet come with you. It doesn't always happen. Horses are easily distracted. If it happens in a race, the consequences can be disastrous. If a plastic bag blows by, they're going to stop and look at it and go, oh, whoa, whoa, what was that? And that's where sometimes your horse will run out or they might add a stride or try and leave out a stride in front of the jump. Their attention span is very short. Picasso, maybe Ruff has made a huge run. He's gone. So Sagamore lost his concentration, mistimed his jump and threw his rider. But thanks in part to a fellow jockey, Simon Mills survived. Normally, I was one of the toughest stable chase riders around. I'd knock them down and flatten them and do all sorts of things to win a race. But this particular day, yeah, it just, um, the race, as I said, just went out of my mind and I just tried to be darndest to try and save him. He knows how I feel and, uh, you, know, I, you know, I owe my life to him. In Adelaide, racing fans will always remember Simon Mills as the jockey who had both an incredible accident and the good luck to survive it. After the break, a ride on a subway turns deadly for passengers in Canada. And pilots of a Learjet in California just managed to steer their way out of catastrophe. In the skies over California's Mojave Desert, a specially modified Learjet embarks on a top secret military exercise. The two civilian pilots at the controls are part of a training mission for the California Air National Guard. Their plane is equipped with sophisticated electronics gear that transforms the Learjet's image on radar to look like enemy aircraft. The Learjet can be made to appear as anything from a Russian MiG-29 to a drug lord speeding jet. It's just before Christmas 1994 in central California. The weather is balmy. The exercise goes well, but as the Learjet approaches the airport in Fresno, a warning light flares on. Clear emergency, engine fire, media vectors. The pilots are given immediate clearance to land, but six miles from the airport, another distress call. The pilots head for the runway, desperately struggling to hold their plane on course, but they lose control and find themselves heading straight for an elementary school filled with children. The pilots fight to avoid coming down on the playground. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm not going to... Full power, full power, hold up, I... Hold up, dude, I'll see you right around right in. The plane crashes into an intersection 300 yards beyond the school, exploding on impact. The crash ignites a swathe of destruction that engulfs first one block, then another obliterating valuable clues to what went wrong. Firefighters swing into action. Rescue workers tend to the injured, while others try to make sense of the chaos. Oh, 
I saw him coming in, I knew he was in trouble because he was like rooftop level. And Gene Wright was driving near the intersection where the plane hit. And, and he just swung around to the left and hit right there and bounced down to there. Breaking stuff off all along. It just, it happened really fast. It's the worst air disaster in Fresno's history. Two were dead. The Jets captain, Richard Anderson, and co-pilot, Brad Sexton. 21 people on the ground are injured. Those who witnessed the crash believe that as the crippled jet began to lose altitude, the pilots used the last of their power to lift the plane over Ewing Elementary School. Meanwhile, investigators for the National Transportation Safety Board painstakingly search for the cause of the crash. We see evidence that something has blown that sheet metal apart. Air safety investigator Bill Waldock studied the Fresno crash. He trains engineers in the nuts and bolts of safety investigation at an aeronautical university in Prescott, Arizona. It's very, very difficult to find all of the pieces of the puzzle and oftentimes you're literally trying to fill in the blanks between those uh, known points of evidence and the gaps that are between them. The Fresno crash was particularly hard to decipher. Fire temperatures of more than 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit melted most of the evidence. And very frequently in a post-impact fire, that's all we have left. But even so, investigators find clues including charred wires that helped decipher the chain of events that led to the crash. Their most important discovery is that the trouble was not caused by engine fires, as the pilots believed. In fact, the pilots were misled by their control panel. The fire warning system burned through uh, and gave a false indication to the crew that they had a fire in the engines. Instead, the fire was in the tail section. It started with a short in the special mission equipment and spread to the jet's flight controls. But tracking down the reason for the short proves much harder. All that's left is twisted, melted debris. The in-flight fire most likely originated with the short of the special mission power supply wires in an area... At an FAA meeting to report the investigation's findings, inspectors reveal that the top secret decoy system had been improperly installed, bypassing the circuit breakers that should have protected it. When the powerful electronic system shorted out, it sparked a fire that damaged flight controls beyond recovery. It shouldn't have happened. Phoenix Air, a private courier that leased jets to the National Guard, is deemed responsible for improper maintenance and inspection procedures. Fourteen other improperly modified Learjets were promptly grounded and rewired. After the accident, Richard Anderson's widow meets with grateful residents. Families of these students forever grateful for his heroic decision and his heroic actions. The pilots' families attend a tree planting ceremony at Ewing Elementary School to honor their sacrifice. Your husband left and your son left a mark that will never be forgotten by these children because when they hear the word hero, it will have a personal meaning to them. Cindy Anderson speaks for both families about the comfort they found in the pilot's final act. I know what type of man Richard was, and these children would have meant everything to him. So my loss, knowing that it's everybody else's gain, I'm okay with that. Following the disaster, the Department of Defense tightened its oversight procedures for civilian aircraft used in military training exercises and Phoenix Air restructured its maintenance program. The jets that crossed the skies in military missions over Fresno are now safer. Everyone's hope is that any emergencies in the future will be imaginary ones on radar screens only. The subway system in Toronto, Canada touted itself as one of the safest in the world. But on a summer evening, passengers could never imagine that they're about to take the most terrifying ride of their lives. Carolyn Smallwood, a student at the University of Toronto, 
boards the last car in a train just before 6 p.m. Within moments, there's a problem, a malfunctioning signal. The train had stopped in the tunnel. While we were stationary in the tunnel, I felt a great change in the air pressure, and it was quite strong, stronger than um, I'd felt before. Behind her, another train has left the station, headed her way. A warning signal tells the driver of the new train to proceed with caution. Instead, he goes to full power, 30 miles an hour, and runs through three caution lights. As he rounds a blind curve, he spots Carolyn's train stopped in front of him. He slams on the brakes, but it's too late. The force of the crash is so great, the train penetrates 23 feet into the rear of the one in front of it. At first, I had no idea what had happened, and it almost seemed like a movie. Everything was going on in slow motion, and then I had the sensation of falling. Roger, 35, can you tell us what's going on there, please? Yes. Rescue teams find dozens of injured passengers. There was rubble all around me. When I looked back, all I could see was wreckage. There was hardly any indication that it had been a subway train, in fact. As paramedic Meredith Morrison and her partner make their way through the dark tunnel, it's eerily silent. Then all of a sudden you're hit with just a massive amount of rescue workers, lights, and heat. The first word I think of is just chaos. Emergency workers descend upon the crash site using every available entrance. Crawling between the seats, Carolyn is among the first of the injured to make it out. She's badly bruised and shaken. I'm in shock, I think. I'm just, it was the scariest thing that ever happened to me. I've never been in any, any kind of thing like that before. Inside the train, Meredith Morrison helps a mother and son stuck in the twisted metal. This was very difficult because we were unable to get the little fella out and he was very scared and he was holding onto my hand and it made it difficult to um, distance myself from the situation. It takes two hours before Morrison and her colleagues are able to rescue the little boy and his mother, but time is running out for the others. Beneath the tangled wreckage, seven people are still trapped. To get to them, rescuers will have to attack the twisted metal that blocks their path. The two trains have expanded outward, virtually sealing off the tunnel. To reach the victims, rescuers must crawl underneath the trains along the tracks. They use power saws to cut through the seats and support poles in the unstable wreckage. As the hours mount, the temperature in the tunnel nears 100 degrees. But one by one, the trapped victims are cut free from the wreck. Only four are still alive. I think in retrospect, everything that could have been done was done, but it was a very long time. And that psychologically is difficult for all rescue workers. Throughout Toronto, confidence in the subway system is severely shaken by the crash. There hadn't been a major accident in 40 years of operation. Investigators needed to find out what went wrong and why. Detective Fergie Reynolds leads the investigation. I believe that this type of an accident could happen in the Toronto subway system. The system was put together and designed so well that really an accident was inconceivable. Okay, what's the measurement on the wheel plan? For nine months, investigators study the wreckage and recreate the moments leading up to the crash. A critical factor turns out to be a device called a trip arm. 
The arm shaped like a hammer is located on the track bed. If a train approaches a red signal traveling 10 miles an hour or less, the trip arm lowers itself, allowing the train to pass. But if the train is speeding more than 10 miles an hour, too fast to stop in a short distance, the arm remains up and trips a lever protruding from the bottom of the train, activating the brakes. On the night before the accident, the driver of run 35, who'd been on the job only two days, ran through a red light, setting off the trip arm. But the next day, when he again sped through a red signal at 30 miles an hour, the trip arm malfunctioned. Gravitational forces, the G-forces, applied on the train as it rounded the bend, allowed it to travel laterally out so far that the wheel of the train struck the trip arm and drove it right down to track bed level. With the hammer down, there is no way it can trip the lever to cause the train to break. The investigators concluded that this mechanical failure, plus wear and tear on the tracks and excessive speed on the part of the driver, all contributed to the accident. Whenever you put mechanical components together with human factors, the potential is there for something to go wrong. As a result of the investigation, nearly 300 recommendations for improving safety in the subway were issued. Among them was a call for increased training for drivers and a backup trip arm to be installed on all blind curves. All of the recommendations have been implemented in Toronto and are being considered in several other cities with similar systems. The disastrous subway accident is one that never should have happened. But from it came hard lessons about man and machines. Neither is infallible, yet when lives hang in the balance, neither can afford to fail. Well, next Tuesday at this time, we'll be going football crazy. Details in a moment, and then a fortnight tonight, a new series, Are You Being Cheated?, which tackles everyone from booze bootleggers to benefit fraudsters and fair dodgers to love cheats. That's Are You Being Cheated? Two weeks tonight from 8.